You be seated. This morning I'm reading from the Epistle to the Romans, the 14th chapter, the first 12 verses, and I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version this morning. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, this this past weekend, I started a a sermon series uh, talking about how we, particularly as United Methodist Christians, interpret um, the faith, interpret our doctrines, interpret the way we do church. And one of the ways we do that is through the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Scripture tradition, reason, and experience. So this past Sunday, I specifically focused on the role of Scripture in the church as, as a, a prime a place where we, we look for, for God's leadership, but, but one of four places that we look. Today, I want to talk more about tradition. And I don't know why, but all week as I worked on this sermon, I keep hearing Fiddler on the Roof and the song. Tradition, tradition. I almost thought about asking you guys to play it, but I wasn't, you know. Tradition. What role does tradition play in church? And what are the positive roles of tradition? And what are things maybe in tradition that ought to be examined or re-examined? Well, tradition is one of those things that guides what we do on a regular basis. Sometimes you can call it habit, but a good church tradition is a habit with a holy purpose. I'm excited this morning that in our second service, I'm going to share with a, with a family, with a Swearingen family, in the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is one of the ancient traditions of the church goes all the way back to the early New Testament, all the way back to the work of Jesus and the apostles. And the way that we baptize in the church and the liturgy we use in baptism, in fact, is part of our tradition which has ancient antecedents. And in baptism and in our other sacrament, Holy Communion, we share those using some traditional means as we worship together. If you're in the second service uh, this morning, uh, you would hear certain words that you would hear and in, in just should hear in any baptism in the United Methodist Church. After baptizing a child in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, again, tradition, I will, I will lay hands on Christopher, and say, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. We believe in baptism 
that a grace gift is imparted in the life of the individual and that God's grace is bestowed through the sacraments. And so the liturgy we share is a tradition which helps us teach that. In Holy Communion, there are certain things that we say in communion that are, that are free form and certain things that are, are pretty flexible, but there are certain pieces of, of communion that are ancient traditions, some going back as far as the 2nd or 3rd century A.D. In most United Methodist churches I, I would walk into, if I would say, the Lord be with you, you would respond... That's good. You all, see, you got it. You know the tradition, don't you? The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise, etc. So there's tradition there, and, and certain things are done in communion. For example, there's the piece that's, that's the holy, holy, holy. The technical term is the sanctus. Holy, holy, holy uh, describes the holiness of God. And then as we move further in the liturgy, there's, there is a memorial affirmation uh, in which we say that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, right? Um, we, we talk about it being a holy mystery. And we do that on our regular basis because when we share at the table, sharing in those ancient words is instructive. It reminds us what communion is about it isn't just getting together and passing around bread and juice. There's a meaning. And we believe also that God's grace meets us in Holy Communion. I think that those are powerful and important traditions. And, and we maintain baptism and communion because they teach us things that God wants us to know. And God has asked us to share in those means of grace. Now, certainly, there are other traditions that you may not be as aware of. The tradition of lighting candles representing the Holy Spirit in the church is an ancient tradition of the church. Uh, having a Bible present uh, on, on a communion table or altar is, is, is a fairly long tradition. Singing praises in worship, sharing from the Scriptures, preaching, part of our tradition. But even things like gathering in a church building on a certain day, tradition, those are good, and they help us carry the faith forward. Now, where it has become difficult for people in recent years, I think, is that we, we have uh, sometimes competing traditions. And probably, if you were to ask members here at First Church which worship service is the best, you would say the one you attend, <laughs> right? You come to first service because you like first service. You like the way we worship in first service. You like the style of worship in some way. Or maybe you like to worship at 8.30. You like the time. But it's a tradition for you to be in this service. Others who come to the next service would say, well, I, I like the style of praise music and things that we do in that service, and that meets a need for me. Those who come to the third service who, who have a, a certain feel and, and interest in liturgical worship and feel that that feeds them, enjoy that tradition. And it is a blessing, I believe, that we get to offer worship in multiple worshiping traditions. I think that's really powerful. It allows us to, to touch the heart of God in different ways, in ways that touch us. But at times... At times, worshiping traditions have actually been a source of conflict within the church. Would anybody believe that? That worship could be a conflict? But it is. When contemporary worship started becoming a thing, I saw articles being published called The Worship Wars. As churches struggled with how to effectively share in traditions that, that are compatible but different. Those are all positive aspects of tradition. But sometimes also, traditions can have negative aspects. And this is where I think we need to be continually examining tradition. And by the way, we actually should continually examine all of our faith all the time. Because we all should be growing in our faith. We all should be knowing more about Christ. We all should be understanding better than we did before. And so we should always be seeking to perfect our faith. 
So sometimes we have to look at our traditions and, and examine them and say, okay, is that serving a purpose? Now, first of all, you even have to ask yourself, what's the purpose behind the tradition, right? When we look at communion and when we look at, at the, the sacraments, we see purposes. One of the purposes in the tradition of baptism that we practice as United Methodists is that it is a, an appropriate and powerful means to welcome children into the family of God. Now, I know you can be baptized at any age, but this year one of our themes uh, is to talk about family. Uh, we have a new logo and a new, new motto, Family First. And when we talk about family first, we don't mean just one kind of family. We're not talking the U.S. demographic of, of two people with 2.3 children and a dog. That's, there's all kinds of families. There are blended families. Uh, there are single families. There, there are, are, are families where folks have children and folks don't have children. There are all kinds of ways of looking at family. The church is a family. And actually, the family of God, which is much bigger than the church, is also family. So we want to be able to talk about all aspects of family. One of the things I love about our understanding of baptism is that it allows me to effectively see and talk about God's prevenient grace. Grace, by the way, is God's unmerited favor. Something you get that you don't deserve because God loves you. Unmerited. You didn't earn it, but God loves you. Prevenient grace is grace that comes to you before. Before you could understand. Before you could even respond. Just like an infant in the arms of a parent, and particularly a newborn, they do not yet know how to respond fully to love. And yet they receive love from their parents. They receive love from their family. They get cuddled and talked to. They get clothed and fed. They get taken care of even before they could respond. When, when Christopher comes for baptism in the second service, we know Christopher is already loved. We know he is already loved. And we don't, for example, say to our children, well, you know, I'll love you when you get old enough to do something for me. When you're old enough to mow the lawn, you know, then, then we'll start talking about love. Or when you're old enough to clean your room, or, or when you're old enough to say the words, I love you, no, that's not the way God works at all. So this means that God loves everyone, including those who have yet to respond to that love. So when someone is baptized, I am not baptizing the child. You're going you're to say, well, I just thought you said you were doing that baptism in the second service. I, I actually am not the actor in baptism. I am there to guide the baptism, but God is the actor in baptism. God is the one who acts gracefully in the life of the child. The child is not the, the actor, nor are the parents. It is a gift from God. By the way, this is why we don't re-baptize in our church. We don't re-baptize. We're so serious about that as United Methodists that it is actually a chargeable offense for a pastor to perform a rebaptism. It's a chargeable offense because you are telling people God did it wrong the first time. We don't care how much water you used. You can pour, you can sprinkle, you can dunk. I think it was a little bit irreverent, but I suppose you could baptize with a super soaker if, if you wanted to. It's not the water. Yes, our liturgy is important to us, but if you were baptized in some other community of faith using some other Christian liturgy, yeah, you are still baptized. Whether you were a child or an adult, whether you understood it or didn't understand it, it is a grace gift of God. And God did what God did correctly, lovingly, graciously. And so to me, it's one of the best pictures of that pre prevening grace. 
preventing grace, as, as John Wesley called it, but the word preventing has changed meaning since he wrote. That's why we use the term prevenient. God jumped in ahead. God reached out first and said, I love you. God opened God's arms first. And there's joy in that because it not only means that Christopher is welcome, but any and all who come are welcome. It's the tradition of the church. And it's a good tradition. The traditions we ought to consider changing are those which get in the way of the deeper traditions such as what happens in baptism. The deeper traditions. Sometimes we have told people things just have to be a certain way, you know, because it's our tradition, but we just don't know why we do it anymore. And we make people feel like they're not a part In one of my previous congregations, we had a, a gentleman who felt unable to come to worship because he felt like he didn't have the right thing to wear or that he looked like other people in the congregation. And we very intentionally and carefully told this gentleman, no, come as you are. Come as you are. But sometimes we've created traditions that get in the way. Or, or we tell people somehow that they have to understand the faith before they can become a Christian. Or that they have to know everything about God. Or we, we put barriers in the way that frankly God doesn't put there. Even if you are sitting out in the congregation struggling with whether you even believe in God or not. Let me tell you that God believes in you. Even if you are struggling with your faith today, God is reaching out in love. Now notice this passage talks about food and drink and those kind of things in there because in Paul's day, there were lots of controversies over what was appropriate to eat, whether it had to be kosher or not, or whether um, there were it was a actually a practice that meat that was sacrificed um, on altars to other deities was then later sold in the market. I mean, that's just good business, right? You, you kill this animal, you don't want to let it go to waste, so you sell it to the local, to the local Hy-Vee store, you know, and they butcher it up, and, and, and uh, um, maybe, maybe meat sacrifice to idols is our new GMO, non-GMO thing, you know, our old non-GMO thing. And so they would have this whole argument about, can I eat meat that was sacrificed to an idol of another god? Because I don't believe in that god. And Paul argued, rather forcefully, that we only believe in one god anyway, right? And we don't believe that gods of gold and stone are actually gods. So do what your conscience tells you. But there were people who picked at the choices that others made. Now, this is one of the things that I like about United Methodist is that we try to be, we don't always really succeed in being, but we try to be a broad church. There are churches who make it their business to tell you every detail of everything that God is doing and you've got to believe it a certain way. Down to how the second coming is going to happen, exactly how people are redeemed, exactly what particular interpretation of the Bible, or even exactly how the Bible was inspired. And of course, I always want to ask folks like that, who gave you a hotline to God? Because as far as I can see, much of that is left unsaid in the Bible, unsaid in Christian tradition. And so we have developed other traditions to try to understand but we try to be a broad church so that you and I don't have to agree on everything to fellowship together. Now, there are things that strain the bonds of that horribly. We have very different ideas on many topics. And as United Methodists, we know that we're struggling over issues like same-sex marriage, views on human sexuality, as is our nation. And we don't all agree with each other. 
How will we struggle with these things to remain in fellowship together? Well, we can, we can either slavelessly, slave, slave-ishly, slavishly follow tradition or just toss all tradition out, but probably neither one of those is right. It's a struggle. It is a struggle to be the church today in the world and in a world that's changing faster and faster every day. It's a struggle to know the right answers. Seldom are the right answers. No, let me back up and say that, not say it that way. It's never the right answer, and you're welcome to disagree with me because we're all Methodists. It's never the right answer to say because you and I differ that you or I should be excluded. God's prevenient grace doesn't allow for that. God's grace and God's salvation is frankly not dependent on any of us. And so if if we do something that allows me to force you or push you away, or you do something that pushes me away, or we push each other away, we have failed. Because if the message to our world is good news, Jesus loves you, bad news, Christians don't love each other, we have failed. No, in the font, we are reminded God loves all of us. I never ask anyone when they bring someone for baptism if they understand baptism or not. I explain some things about baptism. I never ask the candidate. I guess I could have asked Christopher, but I don't, I would have not sure what response I would have gotten, right? He'd probably just smile at me again. Do you understand this? Of course he doesn't understand it yet. It's not the understanding or having all the answers that makes us believers in Christ. It is the acceptance of the grace of God. Now, I believe that our traditions, and particularly the best of our traditions of openness and grace, of using things like the Wesleyan quadrilateral, can guide us to love each other, to be together in Christ. But none of that's easy. None of it's easy. Some of us can honestly say, it's not even always easy to love members of our own family or to always love our friends. Love isn't easy. But it's God's answer. Sometimes you will notice that I do have a traditional bent when it comes to certain things. And when particularly it comes to the ancient practices of the church, I so enjoy being able to share with with the church That when we gather at the font, we will be doing the same thing that believers in Christ have done for nearly 2,000 years. And we will call on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and we will bless the water together and we will bring a new child into the church as Christians have been doing for nearly 2,000 years. And we will know that God will be with that child and that it will be our responsibility to support and help him in the faith because it has been our responsibility for 2,000 years. And these are traditions that should never die. Let's pray. Lord, help us to find the right traditions. Those that feed the soul. Those that perpetuate and empower the means of grace. Those that help us teach the empowering love of God through Jesus Christ. Those who bring us together instead of pushing us apart. Those who share in love and acceptance instead of doubt and fear. Those that struggle mightily together. And let us cast aside everything, Lord, that prevents us from following you knowing that what matters most is the gospel of Jesus Christ above all. Bless us, fill us, guide us with your love. In Christ's name.
Amen.